Welcome to Front Royal Presbyterian Church. It's such a gorgeous day. I thought I would enjoy God's creation and give you the message from in front of the church today. Today is a wonderful day where we get to give thanks because we have the opportunity to take reach bags out into the community. So we'll be praying for that. This coming week is dinner together. And so if you're free on Thursday night, we would love to have you help serve our neighbors around us as well as our church will be at the Jubilee, which will be handing out candy and playing games with kids. Um, and we'd invite you to join us on that as well. So you can email us here at the church and join us at any of these wonderful events as we celebrate God and tell and share the good news by feeding and loving other people. My friends, thank you for joining us for worship today. If this is your first time, a sincere welcome. We hope that you'll find this to be a time of worship and praise as well as a time of peace and where the spirit can move. If you have any questions about our church, please feel free to check our website at www.frontroyalprez.org. Now, my friends, let us worship the Lord our God. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. With our lips and with our hearts, we bless God in every moment of our lives. With our ears and with our hearts, we will hear the cries of our sisters and brothers. In every painful moment, in every broken place, with every gift and with our hearts, we will serve God and all of God's children with every moment of our lives. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Gracious and holy God, we admit that it is easier to have pain causing words on our lips than praise for another. Our foolishness often keeps us from seeing the deep hurts and hunger of the suffering who are around us. We stand by the side of the road, afraid to step forward in faith, afraid to trust that you are with us, afraid to cry out for healing and hope. We are not people who repent in ashes and dust, but we do know we need your mercy and ask that you forgive our faithlessness, our fears, our hurts. Healer of all people, we lift our hearts and souls to you, that through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we might find your grace, discover your love, and serve your people in your name.
Lord, it was us who was broken and is you that healed us. By the power of these waters, Lord, that seem so simple, you cleanse us from our sin and offer to us forgiveness. As we celebrate and as we remember our baptism, may we know that we are forgiven and be at peace. We learned then that this miracle was a living parable for the apostles. Right now they can partially see, but soon they will see completely. We now have another blind man, and this story is also a living parable for the apostles. Jesus has been continually opening the eyes of the disciples, but a blind man can still see better than them, and yet their faith will still heal them. This story takes place just outside Jericho, and Jesus is with a large crowd. The blind man, a man named Bartimaeus, is sitting on the side of the road begging for money when Jesus walks by. When the crowd tells Bartimaeus who is passing by, he yells, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The crowd is not happy with this, and they try to silence him. But he yells all the louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then Jesus calls Bartimaeus over to him. Bartimaeus is so excited that he flings his cloak away. He then jumps up and comes to Jesus. And then Jesus asks Bartimaeus a very important question. A question that I think we should all contemplate. What do you want me to do for you? Are you simply begging for money, or do you want to be healed? Do you want the responsibility that comes along with being healed? I think we often don't want Jesus' touch in our lives. We like the sympathy that we get. We like being able to complain. Woe is me! Please give me more stuff! We like that we can blame all of our failures on a specific weakness you really want Jesus to heal you? Bartimaeus was ready. Jesus tells him to go, and instantly his eyes are opened. But he does not do what Jesus says. He doesn't go. He follows. He walks towards Jerusalem. He doesn't know that the cross is going to be there for Jesus in Jerusalem, but he will go with Jesus anywhere. Are you willing to walk with Jesus? Or would you rather stay in the safe and familiar life you know, even if it means you remain blind? Do you want to see? The Call to Offering As we worship, so we also give with joyful hearts from the many blessings we each have received from God's hand. May our gifts be used to answer the needs of those who seek you, O God, delivering them from their fears, listening to their cries for help, offering refuge to those who are searching for hope. We have many ways to give here at Front Royal Presbyterian. You may give of your finances, your hands, your prayers, your offerings of worship, and through service. We invite you to join us as we continue to spread the good news. Let us pray. Lord, you alone are good, and you alone are the one from which all blessings flow. So receive what we have to offer in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Use it in your kingdom. Amen.
Our first reading is Psalm 126, a song of ascents. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like the streams in Negev. For those who sow with tears will reap with songs with joy. And those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
As we go to God in prayer today, we remember Tanya Lott's father, who has, is having surgery today, which is Friday, um, with cancer. And, you know, it's been on my heart about the missionaries being kidnapped in Haiti and the things that we don't pay attention to in other countries until it directly involves us. Um, there's a lot to pray for. Join me. Lord, your creation sings all around us. The crickets in the bush, the birds in the air. Things seen and unseen all sing praises to your glory, and so we do as well. We give you thanks, Lord, for this day. We ask you, Lord, to walk with us as we worship, as we praise, as we give thanks, and as we offer our prayers to you, Lord, be with us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Be with us in such a way that we cannot help but recognize your face when we see you in a stranger on the street. And Lord, make us so uncomfortable with the way things are that we can't help but have the courage and the wisdom to move, to change things towards your way, your kingdom. For you called us out of darkness, Lord, or you called us out of sin, and while we were still broken and still sinners, it's you that loved us and called us home. And so, Lord, as we do that, as we try to bow on our knees and humble ourselves before you, remind us that we are dust and to dust we shall return, but we are also children of God. In that we are blessed, we are adopted into the family and we give thanks for one another, for our family and brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. We ask your blessing, Lord, on those countries that are still trying to find their way that deal with political issues that we can't even fathom. Dictators and tyrants, kidnappings, natural disasters, war, famine, refugees, homelessness. These nations that are, are tinkering on that edge, Lord, help us to pay attention to them, not only when it directly affects us, but each and every day. For you've told us that our family is not just those that worship with us and look like us, but all of those who you've called around the world. Lord, we are but one small church, but we give thanks. You've blessed us beyond anything we can begin to measure. You have given us the opportunity to build a playground for the kids. You give us what we need to serve those that are hungry. You give us what we need to do in this community to make it a better place, a place for everyone. And we give you thanks, but we ask you also, Lord, to encourage us to use it wisely, to be smart. And we ask you, Lord, as we gather today in prayer to be with those that we lift up, specifically Tanya and her dad and their whole family as they wait for answers, as her dad begins to heal. We continue to keep in our prayers the Ostemeyers as they grieve. We keep Jill's family in our prayers as they grieve. We lift up to you continually, Lord, Richard Johansson and the Burtz, Elaine King, and those that are finding it hard in this difficult time of COVID to be staying at home. Help us, Lord, in our own unique, different ways to reach out and love one another. You alone are good, Lord, and you alone are the one that we worship today. You alone are the one that we lift up and praise, for it is through your Son's name that we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So this is the second time I'm recording this sermon. Earlier yesterday I recorded it, uh, closer down to the street as you can tell by some of the other videos and I actually had some middle schoolers leaving their school and walked up, walking up asking what I was doing 
So I invited them up and the camera was still rolling and I told them that and I asked them some questions about our text today. And I'm going to talk about their answers in a little bit. And I thought, oh, won't it be cool to include those in the sermon? But then I decided you can't do that without parental approval. <laughs> but I can tell you with absolute certainty that every one of those middle schoolers that I talked to, there are about half a dozen, love our Zach Logan. So this is the uh, scripture passage for today. It comes to us from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. And it comes to us, again, right after we talked a few weeks ago about James and John asking to be on Jesus' right and left. And this is chapter 10, verses 46 and following. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, my teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and followed on the way. Let us pray. Your word, O oh Lord, is eternal. It is truth. It is real. Despite the year, the day, the time, Lord, you have a message through the Holy Spirit that you send to us. Speak to us once again. Through the power of your Son. Amen.
As I mentioned, uh, when I recorded this earlier down by the street, these middle schoolers were curious. And so I asked them to come on up and I asked them a few questions. And I told them, what would you think if there was a man on the side of the road, he was blind and he was begging? Would you think he's important? Interestingly enough, two of the kids said, of course he's important, knowing that the story was going somewhere unexpected. And the other two kids, few kids were, yeah, no, not so much. He's a beggar. I said, what would you do if you saw a beggar on the side of the street? Of course, the two that thought he was important said, we'd stop and give him food. And the others were like, no, I'd just keep going. I wouldn't stop. <laughs> Honesty is important because I can guarantee those kids have passed people on the streets around here and just walked on by. Maybe even made a joke or refused to have eye contact so they didn't have to actually see them. Today's story about Bartimaeus is about not being seen, but it's also about being told to be silent. And as a female clergy, you can imagine that I'm told to be silent more often than I can count. And not just by my friends when I tell too many stories, but in fact, there are stories and stories of women who paved the path before me that made it possible for me to speak in the pulpit, and I give thanks for that. And I pray that when my Isabel is older, clergy might have an equal footing. I've been told that you um, can't wear a red cowboy boots. You have to wear black pumps and a black dress, and the black dress has to come at least halfway down your calf. I've been told all sorts of things. You wouldn't even believe it. What people say to me and, and try to silence my voice. But the question is why? Why is it that people want to silence other people? In fact, in seminary, as we were preparing for our ordination exams, this goes to male and female, as we were preparing for our ordination exams, we actually were told specifically what to say and what not to say. And many times as students, we would turn to them and say, but this is important. I don't agree with this part of the Book of Confessions or the Book of Order. And each time we were told by our professor, you can't rock the boat if you're not in it. Silence, at least for now. So we're taught from very early that we have to be silenced about certain things. We were told as women that if you preach from a woman's perspective too much, you will be naturally assumed to be a bra burning liberal. As I said, I've been told I'm going to hell because women cannot be ministers. And in the same manner, I've been told that any church I serve will be condemned because they chose me. In a shocking story years ago, I went to visit a, a gentleman, a church member in prison. I'd been there before, and I walk in and I show him my credentials. I have my Shenandoah membership card and my driver's license, my business card. And he looks at him and he says, I'm going to need one proof that you are who you say you are. I say, okay, well, what do you want? I need to see your ordination certificate and your diploma from seminary. Okay. So I call my assistant, she faxes it down. So now he's got my Shandell Presbytery card, my driver's license, my business card, my diploma, and my ordination certificate. Still not enough. I said, well, what can I do? He says, if you can find two male colleagues that will vouch for you, we'll let you in. Two male colleagues had to vouch for me being a female minister before they would let me in. <laughs> It's a long line of how clergy are silenced in history. That's not even just women, that's all of us. Because we have to walk a fine line each Sunday morning between a tame Bible message and something that is actually truth and gospel. Because we put Jesus in this nice little box over here that Jesus loves the children, but he didn't really toss the tables in the temple. He didn't really get angry. He didn't really eat with sinners. Those passages come up for just a little bit. We like Jesus in our nice, comfortable box where there are no politics. Bartimaeus is in this story. He is you and he is me. He's on the side of the road. He has been a beggar for his life. He is on the lowest rung of society, period. And he cries out for Jesus. And I, I, I wonder what it must have felt like to be so physically contained with no sight and to call out. 
because he was contained within his own world, but yelling for something else, calling out from his place, and he could not be silenced. And I admire Bartimaeus for that. When told to be silent, he did not give in. In fact, the scripture says, many sternly ordered, ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even loudly. Thank God, literally, Bartimaeus won't be told to shut up. And I love that. He won't shut up. Even though people tell him to. Even though he's making others uncomfortable. He, he, he doesn't listen to the society's form that says, you be quiet, you don't fit here. So when people usually tell us to shut up, silence us, put us on the sideline, usually we go ahead and oblige. Because we don't want to mess up the carefully constructed system that we've put in place. Bartimaeus is a beggar. And if he's not a beggar on the side of the street, then who is he? Because that doesn't fit my social concept. But Bart knows more. Bart Demaeus is at that point where he is no longer confined. He is free. And we do not understand that feeling. It's critical. He is free. And I don't know why he feels free. Could it be because he feels that there's nothing left to lose? Is it that he has suffered enough? Is it that he just doesn't care anymore? Whatever it is, Bartimaeus is free. He's free to call out. He's no longer beholden to any of society's rules. He's no longer having to conform to the society that which is around him. Bartimaeus is free. And I can't imagine what a feeling that must be. What a feeling it must be not to have to worry about offending someone, upsetting someone. Free. And in that same question, I want to ask you, how often have you been told to keep silent? How often are we asked to keep our voices down to a minimum just in case there's some offense? Just in case we rock the boat? The interesting thing is in session meetings, when there's a touchy topic, it usually goes like this. I'll bring it up. Everybody will sit quietly. Nobody will say anything. And I'll try to start the discussion, and they just nod their heads, and I don't choose a position. And it's very quiet, and nobody has anything to say until one person speaks. And either it's in opposition or in favor of whatever we're discussing, but once that one person speaks, everybody else feels like they have a voice. Things silence us that we don't even know. We're not even aware of. And when we're silenced, sometimes it makes us less human. Because when we are silenced like this, society has taken over and walled us in like Bartimaeus, blind to see what can be. The systems, the powers that are in control, we are without power, unable to stop ourselves. In a way, when we are silenced, we are bound by the histories and fears of those that have gone before us. But Bartimaeus would not stay silent. And it's hard today because today we talk too much. We talk about this, that, and the other, and they get on this vanity pedestal of vanity, and, and I'm right and you're wrong, and we tell facts that we get from social media, like they're truth. And when we speak so loudly and so confidently of our point of view, we are silencing others. At that same time, we are saying, my voice is more important than yours. We ultimately silence another when not only do we not speak, but when we fail to shut up. Think about it for a minute. People are crowding around Jesus on this road to Jericho. They're all crowding around him. There had to be a plethora of sounds, a cacophony of, of animals and children running and people crying and screaming and, and pulling at things, a crowd on the road. And you've got to think that, that there's probably, you know, in the background, there's trading in the marketplace. There's all sorts of sounds. And Jesus picks up on one. He hears the cries of Bartimaeus. And those that are closest to Jesus those that know the best who Jesus is, 
they hush him up and tell him to be quiet. The disciples. In Mark, we call them the duh disciples. They're good church people. They're just trying to keep the riffraff at bay. They're trying to keep some sort of semblance and order. And those good church people only want the best for Jesus. But in so doing, they forget that they're not called to uphold society's rules. They're called to work into the kingdom. Now, Bartimaeus is, is all names have meaning. So Bartimaeus is son of Timaeus, which is interesting because the scripture says Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, so it's redundant, says the same thing twice, and that's important because that says, hey, look here. So what does Bartimaeus mean? There are many that said that it means son of honor, but to me, in this passage of scripture, the way he's treated, son of dishonor. Because here we have this circle of these people that are complicit in maintaining a system of, quote, honor and order and system and this son of dishonor is threatening to uphold it to upend it excuse me as Bartimaeus cries out the crowd and the blind followers of the system hush him up they rebuke him and Jesus hears that and I love what scripture says because scripture says when Jesus heard it and told his disciples to bring him here, he literally leapt up, threw his cloak on the ground and followed the voice having no sight through that crowd of people everywhere to the one that he knew could give him some sort of hope. But he leapt and he tossed his cloak from his shoulders, which means that any money, any coins that he would have collected that day, anything that he might have collected on the street as a beggar went on the ground as well. He left it all behind. He leapt up and he ran towards Jesus. And once he gets there, it seems pretty obvious. It seems really obvious, in fact, that he wants to see again. But Jesus does something really important here. He looks at Bartimaeus and he says, what do you want me to do for you? You may not think that's a important. You may think, well, that's kind of redundant too. He obviously wants to see. But it's been said that Jesus, in just simply asking that question, offers the dignity of asking someone so long silenced to speak their voice, to have their voice heard, honored, and respected and tended to. And most of all, the Son of God refuses to think he knows what is best for Bartimaeus. Has there ever been a time in your life that you were silenced? That your story was not told? The whole truth was not in the open? Because by doing so, you threaten to change, upend a society that is very comfortable in its rules and the way things work. And in that world, the truth sometimes doesn't even matter. And I'm tired of being silent. I know you can laugh at that because I'm not a very quiet person, but I'm tired of being told to shut up. Don't say this in the pulpit. Don't be political. Don't talk about gender. Don't talk about sex. Don't talk about this. Don't talk about that. Keep it nice and on the line. <laughs> and I love that quote that Jacob gave me when he was in high school. Speak for the silent. Stand for the broken. They did not do that for Bartimaeus. And we oftentimes don't do it as well. I'm growing weary of biting my tongue. There's so much going on out there. Like you, I'm tired of self-censoring just to keep the peace. I'm impatient with the system around us that perpetuates us to stay within our lanes so that the system can be upheld. It bothers me that any of us are still told to be silent in order to maintain the status quo. Because what I believe God has in heart for us is so much bigger than anything I can utter. Bartimaeus is healed. What next? He did not keep silent. He found his voice. He found his sight. And he could not go back to his old life, whether they wouldn't receive him or whatever. 
He could not go back. The only right response for him was to drop it all and follow Christ all the way to Jerusalem. And that's what scripture says he did. His gratitude for being healed is not merely words, it is actions, because he knows he can never, ever repay Jesus for what he's done. You and I live in a world that, much like that day with Bartimaeus, is broken beyond repair. We live in a world that puts people in their place so that we can keep our own status quo, so that we are not threatened. We live in a world that thinks of me first, you later. Maybe our voices are too loud because we're screaming them and not listening. Or maybe our voices are not being heard at all because we're too terrified of offending somebody. We have fallen and we need another to help us up again. We are blind and like Bartimaeus, we crave sight. So for you, be like Bartimaeus. Don't be afraid to speak. Speak your truth. In a world where everything must stay status quo in order to make it work, sometimes we have to rock the boat. As a result, Bartimaeus got his sight and a new calling in life. Who knows what God might give you? My friends, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. My friends, go from this place. Go and reach out to those that are silent, those that cannot stand, those that are broken. Use your voice for them. Stand next to them. Speak for them until they can be heard. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. Shalom, 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 Shalom.